Make you welcome, Ted Taylor. You know, all night I've been looking at this thing and it was a piano. I was thinking I was going to do this Tom Waits stuff, but maybe, yeah, maybe next time. Anyway, I wanted to just preface my own story by saying um, a lot of you who know me, you know I also I teach yoga. And when I was in Santa Fe, I just got back from Santa Fe, I was over there for two years. And I was uh, teaching yoga, but not only just the postures of yoga, but also philosophy and history. And during my, uh, in the midst of my research, I found that in the older days, when there was a lot of the oral traditions and the spoken word, a lot of those, you think of like the Mahabharata or the stories of Homer, you know, they're just so incredibly long. And it took an incredible amount of, how can I say this, breath control. There was a certain pattern to the breath in telling these stories for, you know, 12 hours and 14 hours. So for, they, there's a theory that from this breath control, people started to get in these sort of meditative states, not so different from the Kaimar, Kaimar path, Kaimar pass, probably. But these, these states that people get into and they would say, this is actually the origins of meditation. We're talking like 4,000 years ago. Meditation, obviously, is all about mindfulness training, right? So I'm going to tell a story about a day that was particularly not mindful. When I was up in Hokkaido, it was the summer of 97. And I think, Chris, you brought up about wolfing. So there was a farm. It's now a wolfing farm. But back then, it was an organic, well, yeah, like an organic farm, um, and the idea is you go and you work the land during the day, and then at night you go into the city of Kushiro, which is about an hour away, it's in eastern uh, Hokkaido, and you teach English at various places through the city. And um, <clears throat> so I showed up for this in the summer of 97. It was in the midst of 11 months on the road. I traveled through Asia for 11 months, intending to spend the summer up there. I got there. Um, this was an old hippie commune, so that, I'm talking again 97, so back in the 70s, a lot of Japanese dropped out up there started a commune, so by the 90s, they were starting to open up to foreigners to come and work. And so I was working there, well, I showed up to work there, but the day I arrived, I, I was coming up the driveway to find the, the owner, this Japanese guy, heading off to Australia for the summer to do his own work on an organic farm down there. So, needless to say, nothing was really happening that summer. It was a little bit frustrating because there was supposed to be free room and board, but there was no food there, so it was essentially, I was trying to sort of take a break from travel, not spend any money, and then I was going to head back on the road again. So anyway, this wasn't really happening, so I got frustrated and I took off. So I'm, I'm basically hitching and camping around Hokkaido for about six weeks, and I find myself on the Shiratoko Peninsula, which is out, again, it's on the, west, the eastern side, it's that little thumb, it's that little finger that points up the curls and up towards Siberia, so Kamachaka. So anyway, I'm going over these passes, I'm going over these, I'm sorry, not a pass, but I'm going through these hills, these mountains, uh, over volcanoes for a number of days, and I'm coming to the last volcano, and uh, again, it was a day of really bad choices, non-mindfulness training, essentially. And I, I'm coming to this, I'm trying to get to the top of this peak, and I, I lose my way, I lose the trail, but I see that, the, basically, I can see that the peak is just above me, so I start to free climb up this rock face with my backpack, which is probably a good 20K, 25K on my back, which is just stupid. But somehow I topped out at the top. Just as I arrived at the top, the fog closes in, everything. I lose my visibility. So not only did I not know my way up, but I didn't know my way down. And so I had a really bizarre this thing happen where, is anybody familiar with the Brocken phenomenon? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? So Brocken is essentially when you're up in the hills and you're above the clouds, that you essentially see your shadow and it's backlit and it's like, I don't know, 30, 40 meters tall. It's just massive. So right where Bracken was, I just thought, that must be where the trail is. And I moved toward my own shadow. Sure enough, that was the trail. So I'm going down, and I'm basically crisscrossing this, it wasn't such a glacier, but it was essentially a little stream that was iced over. And I'm basically zigzagging across that on my way down, because that's the way that the path was taking me. And I get toward the bottom of it, and I look back, and I realize that I had been walking for about two hours over ice about this thick with about a four or five minute drop under just boulders. So it was just stupid. Again, a lot of bad choices that day. So finally, I get out of the mountains. I come to the road, and I know from, um, I had a copy of uh, Chris Rothorn's bestseller in my backpack. And I come to the road, and uh, there's this one of those scenic turnouts where they had a rail, and people you know, would pull the car off and admire the view. So between the rail, the guardrail, and the edge of a cliff, I had, again, about, I'd say probably three meters. So I set up my tent knowing I was going to have a full moon rising in front of me off the sea of, I don't know how to pronounce it, it begins with an I. Um, it just comes, I was going to get the sun, or I was going to get the full moon. So I set up my tent, 
At the end of this road, I also know that just up the road is a bus stop. So in the morning, I can get a bus back to town. I'm about 14 kilometers up from any civilization there. What I also know from Chris's book is that there are some waterfalls that are hot because they're heated by the volcanoes I had just come over. So I, for the first time in days, I walked up the road, it's about a kilometer away, and I took a, literally a hot shower in these waterfalls. It was amazing. If you ever find your way up there, it's amazing. So, you know, stripped off. It was getting dust now. All the tourists had left, so I'm taking a hot shower. Um, and I had run out of water earlier in the day, so again, another bad choice. And I filled up from the waterfall. And then I start to walk back to where I set up my camp. So uh, the full moon had already risen, fully light. I, did, I felt, well, I don't need my torch. I can see quite well. So I'm just about to my tent. I look up on the hill above me, and sure enough, there's a bear. And it's, a, it's not one of the, brand, the, the cute and friendly black bears that you find in the hills. It's a, I mean, it's a grizzly. It's a big grizzly that's up on the hill above me. So I'm thinking, OK, shit, you know. I, I basically got it. I went over to my tent. I got into my tent. I got into my sleeping bag, as if that's going to help, but I just figured it's, it's another layer that the bear's got to deal with. So, so I get into my sleeping bag, and I'm not joking, within like 30 seconds, the bear's right there, right beside my tent. So this thing, he came down a hillside, crossed a gravel road, went over a metal guardrail to the side of my tent in literally like 30 seconds. It was just incredible how fast he was there. And I will never forget, till the day that, that I die, the mushroom shape of its nose sliding across the tent, the side of the tent, just the shape of the nose just going across. So I spent a lot of time in the backcountry. I'm not stupid. I don't bring food with me. I had just dried food. So he wasn't, whatever it had smelled, it wasn't the dry food. Um, what I reckon it was is because I'd gone through a lot of marshy territory that day, it could smell my boots. My boots were just reeking. They were just foul. So he, he probably could smell my boots. So he's around the front of my tent, and he's, he's lingering around about it a little bit. And um, he's probably there for a good half hour. And at first, you know, I'm terrified, obviously. I'm like, holy shit. Because essentially, if you're within about 30 meters of a bear, you're essentially finished. I mean, it's going to attack you. That's all it is. And this bear is literally like where this chair is, if you've been that far. It's like right here. So the bear is around the front. So the first, like I'm saying, the first 30, 20, 30 minutes, I'm terrified. And after that, I started getting pissed off because I'm tired. You know, I've gone over these volcanoes and I was tired. I just wanted to go cook dinner and go to sleep, and I'm getting pissed off. And lo and behold, this bear fell down the cliff. <laughs> so I'm in my tent, and I hear just bub, 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 and it's just tumbling, tumbling, tumbling down. So I'm thinking, oh, thank God, thank God. But... Ten minutes later, it's back. So it was around me for a good 90 minutes. And again, it's just one of those things that you do, like we're talking near-death experiences like John's talking about. I just went to sleep. Well, I mean, it was starting to feel like I want to go to sleep. I want to go to sleep. So then it dawns on me, little backstory. I just When I went to Hokkaido, I was coming out of six weeks in China. And I realized in China, there's a lot of times when you're occupied with a bus or a train window, your backpack's down here, and you don't know, you know if someone's fiddling around in there. So I, prior to going out into the countryside, when I was in Sapporo, I bought this bell, which you know ostensibly is for a bear. But I thought, well, I'm going to tie it to my pack, because later in the year, I was going to go into Southeast Asia. And I thought, well, I want to have this tied to my pack, so if someone's messing with my pack, I'll hear the bell, and it's all good. So I suddenly remember I've got this bell. So I shake the bell, ring it, and it just the bear took off. It just took off. And at that point, again, I'm tired. I don't know if it came back or not, because I just went to sleep. What I do know is that I ruined a perfectly good water bottle, because I was pissing in it all day, because I didn't want to go outside my tent. And then um, in the morning, when I was leaving, when I was basically walking up the road away from this place, I saw the signs by the same waterfall saying, do not camp here, extreme bear territory, which I didn't know. And this is, again, this is, we're talking like late August, early September, so they're starting to look for food prior to hibernation. So, bear with me. If you're willing to go one extra step with me here, bear with me. That was actually, a, that was accidental, actually. But the, um, in the morning, I, you know, it's quiet. I go out front. I start to set up my cookware. I take the water that I collected from the waterfalls and I poured it into the into the pot so as to make noodles or whatever dry food I had. And the water was pure yellow. It was sulfur. It was pure sulfur. So had I cooked with that water, undoubtedly I would have been very sick or I would have just been in agony through the night. I wouldn't have died, but I would have been really uncomfortable that night. So again, if you can take your 
not thinking this extra step, the bear is a very, it's a sacred animal to the Ainu. So I believe to this day that the bear didn't come down to terrorize me per se, it came down to protect me. So, thank you.